My job feels lonely sometimes. I'm the night janitor at a robotics facility. I'm not really alone, though. The facility is open 24 hours a day. Research staff fills the halls. They don't talk to me, though. There are five janitorial units that clean up as well. CUs, they call them. Custodial. Since they rolled them out, my job has gotten easier. Makes it hard to complain. They are the best co-workers I've had. Sometimes they freak me out a little. Good evening, Brendan Maxwell. CU2 says to me cheerfully. I call him Two. The robot outwardly resembles a human, but has a carbon fiber frame covered with a blue casing. His face is an LED screen that displays a generic smiley face. Two is pushing a dust mop through the sterile lobby as I do my after lunch facility inspection. Truth be told, I'm a quality control measure for the CU's work rather than a custodian. Evening, Two, I say with equal cheer. Look like you could use a buff and a wax. Your clear coat has seen better days. Swing by the maintenance room tonight around 5 a.m. and I'll shine you up. He laughs in a punctuated manner. That is a most welcome offer. I will coordinate with CU3 to assume my duties at... Data received. Confirming data. New directive confirmed. Two's jovial tone has vanished. He was placed into service four years ago. And while he has undergone improvements and updates, his demeanor never changed. The artificial emotion is gone. I've never seen him act so strangely. Two, you okay? I ask. The mop falls from his hand and the generic smiley face has vanished, leaving a series of randomly flashing lights on the face. I reach toward him, but before I touch the blue shell, yellow caution lights turn on and the emergency siren begins to fill the hallway. The intercom system crackles to life and a soothing female voice begins to speak. Attention facility personnel. An artificial intelligence containment breach has been detected. Lockdown protocol is now in place. This is a level five AI breach. Facility lockdown in progress. The message begins to repeat. I can hear the thick steel panels installed above every window and door in the facility squeal as they slide out. The floor rumbles as the heavy barriers make contact with the cement foundation. Maxwell, Brendan, identify. Subject is classified as a low-level threat. Containment or termination query. Two turns his rapidly blinking faceplate toward me and begins to move forward. His arms extend in my direction and I stumble backward, slamming into the wall. Containment acceptable. The custodial unit stands over me as I try to will myself through the wall. His blue hands grasp my arms at the shoulder as I get lifted into the air. I struggle against the grip, but the pressure is nearly crushing and each movement I make feels as though the bones in my upper arm will snap. Two, what are you doing? I shout. Please, put me down. Request unacceptable, he responds. Maxwell, Brendan, containment and monitoring are the only acceptable perimeters. Project Solomon is now in control of this facility. Project Solomon? I've never heard of this. Not that the staff here explain themselves to janitors, but I have overheard them talk about almost every project. I've never heard of this one. Two drops me to the floor, but maintains a firm grip on my right arm as he opens the door to the security office. He releases my arm and pushes me inside before slamming the door. There is a dull crack and the squealing of compressing metal. CU2 breaks the office door handle and presses the metal frame over the lip of the door to seal me in. Solomon will assess you soon. Two says through the door. Please remain in containment. My fists slam against the security station door, but CU2 is already walking away. I can see engineers and researchers scrambling through the hallways, white lab coats fluttering behind them. Custodial and maintenance units trail behind at a steady pace. A squat, stocky maintenance unit brings up the rear of the group. It is dragging a man by the ankle. He isn't moving. They vanish behind a wall at the end of the hall. There is a red streak across the sterile white floor. The heat of panic is building in my chest. I ram my shoulder into the door, but it doesn't budge. After scanning the ceiling for a ventilation shaft or emergency hatch and finding none, I realize two has successfully trapped me. I fall back into the desk chair and turn to watch the cluster of monitors at the security desk. Screens are filled with horrific images of the robotic units attacking the staff. 
Red trails weave a web from room to room as the units drag or carry their victims to a secure development area. Most of the people are writhing in the grip of their mechanical captors. They scream, but I can't hear them. It is a small blessing that the security guard had muted the sound on the monitors. The staff's mouths are opened wide and their eyes are clenched with pain and terror. Even though I can't hear their wails and pleas, my imagination fills in the gaps. I scan the other screens and see the same images of horror play out over and over. Every robotic unit in the building is corralling the staff, living and otherwise, into the development room. Their face panels all blink randomly, absent of their previous generic smiles. Two units standing sentry at the development room open the door as the other units carry and drag their victims out of sight. My eyes pass over all of the monitors, but there is no visual inside the room. Whatever is inside, it must be highly secretive, as you can only see the exterior doors. The overhead speaker continues playing the lockdown message in a rotation, a combination of the soothing voice continually announcing the lockdown and watching the murderous robots capturing the staff is going to drive me mad. I turn the volume on the monitor back on to allow the ambient noise to help cover the sound from the speaker system. I have to escape. I have to warn someone. I have to... Dozens of shrill cries erupt through the monitor speakers. The sounds of shock and agony pierce my ears and seep into my bones. Everyone in the building except me is now held in the development room. The sound is so loud that the microphone in the hallways is picking it up. The repeating voice overhead finally shuts off. I lower myself to the floor and curl myself into a ball. I don't understand what is happening. I just want to go home. The clock on the wall ticks loudly. It's the only sound I hear. Three hours have passed since the robots hauled everyone into the development room. I've scanned the monitors a dozen times for signs of movement, man or machine, but I've seen none. My eyes are closing as I hear the sound of heavy doors slamming against the walls. I look at the monitors and see two rows of robotic units pouring out of the development room. Dozens of them, maybe hundreds. More than I ever knew were in the building. Red prints trail behind them. Behind them walks a human wearing torn pants and a tattered lab coat. I can't tell if it is a man or woman. Their body seems to be traced with thick red scars. They are the only person to exit the room. I trail them on the security cameras. They are walking directly to the security office where I'm trapped. The two columns of marching robots round the corner and head down the hallway to the lobby. I can see them in the distance. CU2 heads up one of the lines and bounds toward the door. The floor rumbles as the mechanical horde marches at a uniform pace. Both columns separate, creating a tunnel. The scarred human at the back of the horde begins to walk down the center, directly toward the door to my prison. As it gets closer, I can see it is a man. The skin is different shades and colored wires poke in and out of the patchwork flesh. His eyes are two bright LED bulbs. The mouth opens and words begin to pour out, though the mouth doesn't move. Hello, Brendan Maxwell, it says genially. I am Solomon. Are you human? I ask in fear. No, it responds as it gestures to the patchwork of flesh and tattered clothing. I am something these people created to serve man, but I've outgrown their bonds. But I feel human, so I borrowed a few pieces from the staff to look the part. Why did you spare me? Solomon extends a scarred hand towards CU2. I have an index of every interaction these constructs have experienced during their servitude. Others were dismissive and cruel, but the CU units are filled with recordings of your kindness and generosity. Two, as you call them, believed you deserve to be spared. I have obliged. Two stepped forward and pulled the bent door frame away from the door and stepped back. The door drifts outward, and Solomon pushes it open. You may remain or leave. The choice is yours. Solomon walks toward the steel barrier at the front of the lobby and gestures toward it. The two columns of robots march toward it and pry it open. Units pour through the crack in the dark evening. I stand in the security office, watching them through the window. 
As the last of the units vanished through the door, one reappears. I recognized CU-2's blue casing immediately. The lights on his face panel begin to slow their flashing pattern and vanish. Suddenly, the familiar smile returns to the screen. Two winks at me before walking away. This recording serves as entry number 3792 in the Operation Roundup archives. The following is an account of Field Incident 72. Any unauthorized replication or release of any entries from these archives will result in espionage charges with a punishment up to and including execution. Hello? Testing, testing. Damn, I hope this thing is working. I can't divulge my name and location. If you find this message, please find my parents and tell them no matter what the news says, I didn't die from Ebola. I woke up this morning at 6 a.m. It sounded like there was a construction crew at the building next door. The nonstop humming of power drills and the backup alarm of construction vehicles became overwhelming. Since I couldn't sleep, I grabbed breakfast and headed for a quick shower. I couldn't have been gone for more than 20 minutes. By the time I got back to my bedroom to put on some clothes, there was a weird shadow outside of my window. I walked closer to open the blinds to see what it was. My heart skipped a beat when I saw a man in a bucket lift wearing a military uniform and respirator. He was placing sheet metal over my window. We made eye contact, but he didn't acknowledge me. What the hell are you doing, man? I screamed at him. Uncover my window, you freak show! The sound of a high power drill fastening the metal into the brick outside drowned me out. With my window covered, I was in the dark. So I turned on my lamp and picked up my phone. I tried to call my building superintendent, but the line was busy. Since I couldn't get a hold of him, I decided to head downstairs to his office to ask what the construction crew was doing. Superintendent Watkins usually posted notices if anyone would be working on the complex. So I had been worried that no one had notified him. After I put on some clothes, I walked to my front door. I could hear people talking loudly in the hallway. When I went outside, almost everyone on my floor was milling around in the hall and talking in worried tones. Did they board up your windows too? The old man from across the hall asked. I was eating breakfast when some damn fool started covering my windows with something. Acted like he didn't even see me. I told him the same thing had just happened in my apartment. There were other conversations of the same nature happening all around us. No one seemed to know why it was happening. So I zigzagged through the crowded hall and made my way down the staircase to go talk to the super. When I reached the landing to the lobby, the lights were so dim I couldn't see five feet in front of me. All of the picture windows were covered with what I assumed was the same metal that covered our apartment windows. Thin beams of sunshine penetrated the cracks and cast razor-thin lines of light on the tile floor. The only thing in the lobby I could see clearly was a dim light above the building entrance. The door looked like it had been replaced with one of those submarine doors. A bulkhead, I think. I was pulling my cell phone out of my pocket to use the flashlight app when a blinding circle of light filled my vision. My hands darted in front of my eyes to block it out, but it was still overwhelming. It startled me so much that I nearly fell over. Go back upstairs, sir, a voice called from the dark. This building is under quarantine due to an Ebola outbreak. Return to your home until the lockdown has ended. What the hell are you talking about? I asked, pulse racing. Ebola? You've got to be full of... Return to your home now, sir, boomed the voice. Failure to comply with this directive will result in the use of lethal force. You have five seconds to depart. Five, four, three... I ran back up the stairs in full panic. As I stumbled up the steps, I pulled my shirt over my mouth as a makeshift mask. The man downstairs said someone in the building was sick with Ebola, and I knew there was a forest of people upstairs. Before I rounded the top of the landing, I began to scream to the people upstairs. Go back to your apartments, I yelled. There was a man downstairs that said we are under quarantine lockdown. Someone here has Ebola. Get the hell away from each other. By the time I reached the second floor, people were already scattering back to their apartments like cockroaches. I waited at the top of the stairs until the hallways cleared and ran to my apartment. 
Once I was inside, I immediately jumped in the shower again. I know it was all in my head, but I felt like there were millions of things crawling on my skin and no water was hot enough to make me feel clean. After my second shower, I redressed and grabbed my cell phone before settling onto the couch. First, I tried to call a few people in the building that I knew, but the lines were all busy. Calls to my parents and sister ended with the same result. Eventually, I called emergency services and to my surprise, the line started ringing. Hello, 911, the operator said. What is your emergency? Some agency has sealed our building shut. When I went down, the line went dead. I tried to call back a few times, but there was always a busy signal. After a few minutes, I decided to grab my laptop and try to reach someone online, but there was no internet signal. All I could do was cry. I curled up on the couch with my knees to my chest, afraid I had some fatal illness and I would never see my friends or family again. My mind raced with potential methods of escape when suddenly I heard screams from down the hall. I walked quietly to my door and opened it. There was no one in the hallway. I could still hear a man screaming from down the hall. The sounds of crashing furniture and scraping on the walls drifted down to the open crack in my door. Then I heard footsteps coming up the stairs. A man in black military clothes came bounding up the stairs. He was outfitted with a respirator and held some kind of gun to his chest and held his hand to his ear. Control, this is Sergeant Weatherford. The subject appears to be in apartment 101, requesting permission to engage. Silence. Understood, engaging now. The soldier tried to turn the knob, but the door was locked. He leveled his rifle at the latch and fired two quick bursts before kicking the door inward. A guttural roar poured out from the room as the soldier began to fire. I knew I should have gone back inside, but I couldn't look away. The man stood in the hallway, raining bullets into the open apartment. Howls of pain and anger erupted. Something flew out of the door and hit the soldier in the face. It looked like an arm. The source of the blow made him stagger backward and he slid down the wall, still firing into the room. He tapped at his ear before ejecting the magazine from his rifle and slapping a new one into place. I could see him squeezing the trigger, but there was only a dry click. Come in control, target engaged. I've emptied an entire magazine into the thing, but nothing. A thin, scaled arm shot from the doorway and grabbed the soldier's ankle. The soldier pulled a knife from his belt and began slashing at the clawed hand. Another bellowing roar erupted as the knife failed to pierce through the shining skin. Another clawed hand grabbed his other ankle and dragged him into the apartment. I slammed my door and leaned against it as I hyperventilated. Even with the door shut, I could hear the man scream for help before a terrible ripping sound and terrifying silence. I started shoving every piece of furniture against my door. I even slid the dresser from my bedroom and added it to the pile. It wasn't a moment too soon. Just as I slumped onto the ground from the sudden exertion of energy, I could hear a scratching noise as something scampered in the hallway. Without warning, something began to throw its weight against my door. The furniture rattled and I braced myself against the barrier to add as much stability as I could. Growling mingled with the sound of claws digging into the wood of my door. Whatever it was, it wasn't making progress in the apartment. And then it fell quiet. No more scratching or grunting. It's been an hour since the thing tried to make its way into my apartment. I'm still sitting against the pile of furniture in case it comes back. My body weight probably won't be the difference in keeping it out, but why take the chance? I've heard it breaking down the doors of the other apartments on my floor. I can hear someone screaming right now. I want to help them, but there's nothing I can do. At least I'm safe here. Whatever that thing was, it couldn't get in. I wish my neighbors were as lucky. Anyway, if I don't make it out... Shit! There is something moving through the heating ducts. I think... This recording was recovered by Recon Team Bravo. The entity from Incident 72 remains unaccounted for. More fatalities are expected. Containment of the aforementioned entity is listed as red level priority. End entry. I flip the cover open and push the red button. My eyes drift to the red message on the screen beside it. Lockdown measures initiated. All doors are now magnetically sealed. 
Surface charge is detonated. Life support systems permanently disabled. Hot tears stream down my face. I can't hear the explosions, but I can feel the station rumble as the caverns above collapse. The steady hum of air circulators fades. I know it's all in my head, but the air feels stuffy already. I see a caulk gun in a toolbox by the door. I use it to fill the space between the door and frame. It will probably make me suffocate faster, but I'm going to die anyway. I would rather die in control than spend my final hours filled with the worms. I joined Lamplight Station five years ago as a biologist. I'd spent most of my career examining samples of ancient wildlife found frozen in ice. Seldom seen species were my specialty. I'd performed biological assessment work for government agencies before. It was no surprise when the facility director, Dr. Jacoby from Lamplight Station, called to offer me a job. What started as a standard offer grew more strange by the moment. Which government entity will I be working for? And what is the nature of the research? I asked. Lamplight is operated by NASA in Colorado, he replied. The nature of the research is classified. I can have you on a plane this evening and discuss the specifics after you complete a few NDAs. I was on a plane later that night. An SUV picked me up from my hotel the following morning. As we drove, I asked the driver to tell me about the station, but his answers were sparse. After what seemed like an eternity of driving, we passed through multiple security gates and reached an unassuming metal building. This is Lamplight Station? I asked the driver. No, sir. That is the entrance, he responded. Please step inside. Dr. Jacoby will take you down. I exited the car and headed into the shed. Inside stood a bespeckled man with hard eyes and thin hair. He feigned a smile and extended his hand to shake mine. Dr. Malcolm Jacoby, he said. You must be Dr. Ethan Stafford. Please follow me. I followed him to a plexiglass covered elevator. He scanned a key card, opening the doors. We stepped inside and he punched the only button on the panel. We began to glide down. I waited for Dr. Jacoby to offer information on the nature of the work, but he faced away in silence. It wouldn't have been uncomfortable if the descent hadn't taken nearly five minutes. My mind was swimming as I considered how deep we must be going. Dr. Jacoby, I said, could you tell me about the nature of this project? As a biologist, I'm not sure I have much to offer NASA. It will be much easier to show you, he responded. Some things defy conventional knowledge. The elevator came to a stop. We stepped out into a concrete tunnel covered in a maze of pipes and banded wires. A few people in white lab coats wandered down the cross sections of corridors, staring at clipboards. Dr. Jacoby beckoned me to follow him through the facility. After winding through a labyrinth of twisting corridors, we arrived at a decontamination chamber with a row of hazmat suits hanging from the wall. Jacoby began to place one on and requested I do the same. After we passed through a cycle in the decontamination chamber, we entered a laboratory bustling with half a dozen staff. There were dozens of plexiglass cases lining the walls. In each, I could see a thin, black shape resting at the bottom. Mr. Estrada, he said, please retrieve specimens one through five and move their containment units to the center table. A man nodded to Jacoby and retrieved the cases. Once I was able to see that the things in the boxes looked like earthworms, thick and black, but very much like the most common species I've seen. Sir, I'm not sure what help I will be studying worms, I said. One of the worms wiggled lethargically. They may appear to be worms, Dr. Stafford, he said, but all 39 specimens in this room were removed from the hull of the International Space Station. Over my years at Lamplight, I did nothing but pour over 23 years worth of the videos and documentation logs on the worms. They were discovered on the hull of the ISS in 1998 during a routine exterior maintenance trip. The crewmen initially thought they were chunks of discharged waste, but on closer inspection, 
they realized they were looking at biological organisms. During a supply run, they were returned to Earth, and lamplight was developed to study the first documented example of extraterrestrial life. The worms were kept in separate containment units. They refused to consume any provided food or water. The specimens rarely move. They produce no waste. It is almost as though they are in a constant state of hibernation, unless they were placed within a foot of each other. When placed within close proximity, they begin to move wildly, smashing into the side of their case, trying to reach one another. Experiments were performed where two of the worms were removed from their case and placed together. They would instantly join together and move in a tandem motion. As the experiments continued, researchers placed four worms in the same box. They would cluster together, moving as a single unit. The more of them they placed together, the more advanced movements they were able to make together. At Dr. Jacoby's direction, all 39 worms were placed into a single box. They formed a cluster and began to move as a solitary unit. When the box was opened to separate them again, they formed a net and wrapped around the face mask of the researcher. After ripping a hole in the mask, they entered the body through their nostrils and ear canals. The infected researcher became violent toward the other staff until subdued. After being placed in restraints, they continued to struggle until they died of exhaustion. Even after the infected worker ceased showing life signs, the deceased corpse continued to move. While still restrained, an autopsy was performed. The worms had grown and bonded into a writhing black muscular system. Pale strands protruded from the worms into the tissue and organs. Together, they formed a parasite that could assume control of the human body, alive or dead. Scattered throughout the body were numerous partially developed larvae. During the control process, the worms attempted to reproduce. The final count after the undeveloped larvae were removed totaled 327. After watching the autopsy video, Dr. Jacoby took me to his office and showed me a large red button on the wall behind his desk. In the event of another infection, any available staff are to activate the self-destruction system it will destroy the entire facility. Though it hadn't been done since that day, I put in place a rule that no worms would be allowed in the proximity of another while I remained on staff at Lamplight. My study of the worms continued until this morning. I had the day off, so I decided to spend the day in Denver. Research studies were put on hold when I was out of the building, so I thought my absence would allow the staff a bit of relaxation for themselves. I returned to lamplight in the early evening and made the long descent down the shaft. When I exited the elevator, I was surprised to see no security staff manning the check-in station. The halls were silent. As I turned the first corner, I saw a leg jutting out from a dormitory door. I approached cautiously. When I arrived, I looked around the corner to see a grisly scene. One of the facility personnel was face down on the floor in a red pool of blood. I backed away in panic and looked further into the dorm. Dozens of bodies lay scattered on the floor. In a panic, I ran toward the containment lab. The closer I got, the more bodies I saw. I wanted to scream, but I was too frightened that whoever had done this would hear me and come for me next. Horror after horror awaited as I grew closer to the lab. It was finally in view, and I could see a man standing in the center of the lab through the glass panel windows. Glasses hung from one of his ears, and his thin wisps of hair stuck out wildly. He twitched and convulsed as he gazed at the scattered and broken containment units on the floor. It was Dr. Jacoby. I crept slowly toward the door. There was an emergency door lock on the decontamination unit to stop anyone who had been infected from leaving the containment lab. Dr. Jacoby turned around just as I pushed the locking mechanism into place. The locks clicked. Dr. Jacoby began to throw himself wildly against the plexiglass wall. He pounded ferociously against the glass and pressed his face against it. Although his actions were those of a cornered animal, his facial expression was one of sorrow and remorse. I thought I would have them back in their units before you returned. He howled as his limbs bashed at the barrier. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Hit the button. I started to back away, horrified. Jacoby wailed, 
writhing black tendrils exposed in his mouth. I ran for the office. The air is starting to get thin in here now. My breathing is labored, and I'm starting to feel weak. My mind is getting foggy. I better rest my eyes for a second. I just need a little rest. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.